There's a couple things I didn't go over. Uh, not a lot, but just a little bit. And I didn't go through this uh, this review of the chapter that came with the textbook. And I always do that when before a test, and I forgot to do that the other day. So that's why I was like, well, we shouldn't be doing the test yet. We're going to do that. So if you don't have your notebook out, you should have your notebook out. Uh, hopefully, everything that we mention as we go through this is stuff that we've already covered. But if it isn't, obviously, we need to make sure it gets in our notebook. So this is the picture of the textbook. That things that we're supposed to learn in this chapter is how the operating system manages hardware, how re system resources help hardware and software communicate, and the steps involved in booting the computer. Obviously, the booting one we've gone over since chapter one, so we should have a handle on that. <coughs> this first objective is the one I care uh, the second most about. And this one, really, I care the least about. And I would have to say that, that uh, I almost, I almost, I want to say I care nothing about it, but I almost care nothing about it. There's way, way, way more depth on system resources in this textbook than what I touch, OK? Because I don't think it's important you know what an IRQ and a DMA channel or a memory address are, OK? Those are three things that we did not talk about. I'm going to write them down real fast so that you know what I'm talking about, OK? But I'm not going to test you on this. In your computer, there are resources. And there are a finite number of resources, OK? And if you ever see a DMA, an IRQ, or a memory address, memory address, those are hardware resources that different things in your computer use, OK? Now, when, you, when it comes to hardware, there's only a finite number, and it used to be 13, maybe more than that uh, now, of interrupt uh, requests available to hardware to use, and DMA channels for hardware to use. And it used to be, and that's why it, it, it's in the textbook to begin with, but I don't think it applies anymore. It used to be that when I put in a, a, a piece of hardware in the, in the computer, I had to assign it which one of these it was going to use, what DMA channel it was going to use, what IRQ it was going to use. I used to have to tell it those things. And if there was already something in the computer that used it, I had to deconflict them. So like one piece of hardware might use only nut channel 3, 5, or 7. And this other one might use 5, 7, and 9. And I needed to make sure they both went on 7 because neither one would work. Okay, Kind of like if. If uh, you guys were on the exact same radio channel and you were using little handheld radios, they'd interfere with each other and neither one of you would get a good signal. Okay, and I say that used to be because now everything's plug and play. You put in your card and BIOS goes and detects it and BIOS deconflicts it and, and it assigns what channels, that's part of the, what it's doing when it's doing the boot stuff, is it's assigning those plug and play channels to your hardware device so they don't conflict. So I don't like spending too much time talking about system resources because 99% of the time it's taken care of for you without you having to do anything. Now, if you become a programmer and you start writing device drivers, then this might be an issue for you. You might need to know how to talk specifically to memory addresses. You might need to be able to tell, because it's one of the things the device driver does is it's software, again, that tells the hardware how to work, and one of the things it's doing, it's assigning these resources out. It's looking to see who's using what, and it's assigning resources. But that's why I say this is kind of important. I need you to kind of have a basic understanding that there are resources that are given out that no devices can have the same resource and work. Okay, So that is what I want you to take away from the conversation today, which we, oh, I thought I didn't pick that which we did not talk about previously, okay, um, that I, I want you to take away that there are system resources that have to be given out, and BIOS usually deconflicts those things, and that's one of the things that gets handed over to the operating system and how it uses device drivers and talk things. So we have to know that level of minutia. You don't need to know what all the IRQs and DMAs and memory addresses are. I don't think that's important for this class, at least not for your level of understanding for this class. So uh, I just kind of wanted to hit briefly on that, OK? So 
We need to understand how the operating system controls the computer, how it manages hardware. The first thing it does when it manages hardware, where does it get the hardware list from? How does it know what hardware is in there to begin? Uh, from BIOS, right? Uh, that's not good. Hmm. That isn't my board. I gave my board away and I thought this one worked fine. Okay. BIOS hands it the system resources to the OS, which uses then drivers to make the hardware work. Okay. And we're going to talk today about a couple different ways that we can see hardware and look at how it's managed. Okay. The operating system also runs all of our applications. It gives us that GUI that we talked about last class, the graphical user interface that allows us to get to our programs. It gives us the icon for Microsoft Word that I tap on and then open up Microsoft Word. Okay? It used to not be that simple. It used to be you had to navigate into the folder back when Windows first came out and we had a mouse and it was oh so cool uh, that we got our first mouse you didn't used to just go and click on, on Windows. We had to go into the program files and we had to look for the actual program. That your shortcut's still going to right now, but we would have to look for the win word and we will double click on it and then we get Microsoft Word. We didn't have icons. We didn't have shortcuts. You had to go and navigate to it to start it. So that's one of the things that the GUI helps provide us, is that ability to run those applications. And then obviously the, the interface for users is the GUI. And all those things together are what allow us to store, retrieve, and manipulate files, right? Our programs, Microsoft Word is what let us edit a document and then save that document. So. Uh, the operating system is what makes all those things happen. It runs the program, it then saves the stuff, okay? And that's one of the things that when we talk about, about memory and we talk about um, how it manages those devices, if the operating system doesn't have the driver for the hard drive or the incorrect driver, it might write things incorrectly and then the things that you think you're saving don't get saved the way you think they're getting saved and you end up with junk when you go to open up your your, uh, your Microsoft Word document again. So all those things come together through the operating system. And you guys got a chance to play with Linux. Mr. Dr uh, Ian, I almost called you Ian Driver, but um, I did know an Ian Driver, just so you know, when I flew 141s. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, uses the iOS all the time, and then um, we use Windows all the time here as well. So we've got, we've got experience with a couple different operating systems and we talked before about all the different levels of operating systems uh, that exist in each one of those too. The, we had the slide up uh, last week or maybe it was the week before that showed all those different versions of Windows that came out. Um, when we talked Microsoft Windows, there are literally tons of them. We talk to Linux about Linux, there are hundreds of them and that doesn't even include all the different variations they've gone through along the way. So there's lots of different operating systems out there but they all do the same thing for us today. Okay. <clears throat> there are different le levels of the way things happen and I realize this is operating system Windows XP but the process is still the same. The operating system provides that GUI that that then it uh, touches all of our hardware through the use of those drivers. And I know I hit that uh, touch it. Uh, I think that was the worst way to write the word drivers, but we'll go with it at the end of that. Right. So it uses those drivers to communicate with all the hardware uh, along the way. Okay, and today we're gonna get, we're gonna do some driver searching and, and finding some drivers because that's one of the things that we didn't do. <coughs> So, this is one of the <coughs> words we didn't really talk about as well, is the kernel, although there was a, a reading that mentioned uh, the kernel. The kernel is the base program for the operating system, okay? You may not know this, but Windows Vista kernel was modified to be Windows 7 kernel, was modified to be Windows 8 kernel, which was modified to be Windows 10 kernel, which is why you can 
<coughs> upgrade from Vista to Windows 7. You can upgrade from 7 to 8. You can upgrade from 8 to 10. Or you can upgrade from 7 to 10 because the base kernel was the same, but XP was a different base kernel. So you could never do this. There was no upgrade path from XP to Vista, just like there's no upgrade path from Linux to Windows 10. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's Linux, because these were both Windows, it's because the kernel is completely different. The base set of code uh, for that OS is completely different. So if you have the same base kernel, it can sometimes use the same device drivers. So you might be able to get um, Windows Vista drivers to work for Windows 10. And you might be able to because there's huge differences in the kernel. But it was based on the same starting point, kind of. One was modified to become the other. It was modified to become the other. Um, whereas Linux and Windows or Mac and Windows is so based different kernels that there's no path between them because they're so, so humongously different. So we, we, when we say the operating system, it includes both the kernel and the device drivers. Uh, there also are BIOS device drivers, and there's all system BIOS device drivers. But for the main part, these are not the ones that are used anymore. They're slower. The device driver that you will get and install that's for the operating system that you're using is the fastest driver you're going to get. It doesn't mean it's always there. Sometimes there are, there are older drivers that just work. That doesn't mean they should be the ones you should use, which is why we go out and look for updated device drivers. Okay. So, And we've said this many times, that device drivers are those programs that make the hardware work with the operating system. Okay. So they're small programs. And I'm going to use small in quotes because some of them are not small. We're gonna, I'm going to download one today and install it on my computer today that is not, by any stretch of the imagination, small. But usually they're small. The device driver for your hard drive, for your keyboard, for your mouse, for your CD-ROM, those are really small programs um, that make those things work. But some drivers are very big, and I'm going to show you which one I'm talking about. Okay. Usually, usually, let me put usually here. They're installed when the OS is first installed. Usually. But the OS may not know what it is. Okay? There are um, still students right now that are coming in um, with their laptops and they say every single time I change the volume on my computer or try to change the volume on my computer, it asks me for a password. Okay, so it's really not asking you a password because it's changed the volume of your computer. It's asking you for a password because there's no device driver installed for the sound card, and that's what it wants. It wants you to install the device driver, and you can't do it because you're not an administrator. You have to be an administrator on a computer to install a device driver. So that's why when the students come in, they're like, every time I change the volume, I'm sorry, that's every time they try to change the volume, that's the indication they get. It's not because it's someone's password protected the volume. It's because there is no driver and install driver. You have to be an administrator. Okay, so it may be installed when it's first installed. May is because it may not know about it. We used to install way back Windows, I'm going to say Windows 95 era, off of a couple floppy drives. Okay. And then Windows 98 got up to be like, I think, 13 floppy drives. Um, but when I, I'm, I'm just going to, so anybody know how much one floppy drive holds? Like, no. OK. So the biggest floppy we ever got was 1.44 megabytes. OK. That's the biggest. OK. So at its heyday, when we were using 13 CDs, anybody want to do that math for me really quick so I don't have to do any math? We'll do uh, fourth grade math. And we'll we'll round. So what? How many how many megs do do are we looking at here? Okay. Here here's how I round this. Divide that by half. We'll call it seven. Seven times three. We're gonna uh, two hundred and ten. Okay. 
that's not, that's not the right answer, that's way high. What did I just do there? I divided this by half, and multiplied that by two, but I rounded it up and called it three instead of 2.8, because three times seven is 21. So at the most, it's 210 meg, right? At the most. 210 meg, 210 meg. That is one third of a CD, okay? There wasn't a lot, it was not very big. Okay, and, and realistically, that's high, so we'll say it's one-fourth the size of a CD. And now we're looking at DVDs, which are, I'm going to say, 8 gigabyte, because they're probably dual-layer DVDs. If they're single-layer, they're 4.5 gigabytes on a CD. So looking at the size, we're looking at 20 times more data than it was before. And part of that is... Because it used to be when we installed Windows 95, the first thing they'd do is go and try to find drivers. Now they include tons of drivers that still doesn't hit them all. That's because Brandon wants to go and make a, a NIT card. He's designed one in his garage, okay, because he's that kind of a tinkerer, and he wants to go sell it. He can. Anybody can make something that works for, for Windows, okay? And he can make a CD that comes with it, but Windows is not going to know anything about the, the NIT card that he built in his garage. So there aren't going to be drivers. There are lots of products from China that, that are perfectly good, that if Windows didn't know about it when the Windows CD was cut, the drivers won't be there and it won't work. So that's why I said usually. There are times you have things in your computer that just don't work when you, when you install them. Okay? And they're usually, I don't know why it says usually, they're always written for a particular OS, but they might work for more than one, okay? So when I go on, we're going to do a little exercise, we're going to go out and find drivers today. You need to find drivers for your operating system. And if you can't find them, they're still written for a particular operating system. It's still going to say, you know, Windows 7, 32-bit. Will it work for Windows 10? It might work for Windows 10, but it's still written for one particular operating system. Okay, so that that's a little bit uh, about um, drivers, and we're going to do some exercises. This is the one of the things that we didn't really talk a lot about. We we glanced a little bit the difference between 32 and 64 bit. Okay, so I'm going to give you an introduction to um, the buses that we're going to talk more about in, in, uh, in chapter four. But when it comes to a bus, there are, and I know we said some of this, which one of the ones is the one that I can move? I think it's this one. Wow, my pen is way off there. That is not the one I wanted. I think that's the one I wanted. But it's all in white. How do I change? I want the line color to be black. Okay, let's see if I get this the way I want it. Much better. Okay. I'm going to use this. Where's that? There we go. Okay. In my very simplified drawing here, to lock it, not control L to erase it. Okay, so what I've got here is I've got our two buses, okay? And this one's the north bus with the north bridge, and we did talk about that, and this one's the south one. And I basically introduced that to you, and this is the CPU. And this is oversimplified because there are in no way, shape, or form boxes, and there are in no way, shape, or form uh, symmetrical like this. The wires go all over your computer and come back but the basic idea is that you have a path of data that goes from your CPU around your north bridge, two components that are on that one, and there's only two on there. And those two are video and memory, okay? There's the only two things that exist on the north bus, and everything else is on the south. Your hard drive, your keyboard, your mouse, your CD-ROM, 
everything is on the south bus. Okay? So we've got these paths of data that information goes around our motherboard. Okay? Now, given that we have those paths, I'm going to call them bus routes. Okay? Because they're called buses, so we're going to go with bus routes. They can go around in packets of information that are either 32-bit or 64-bit long. Okay. There are, there are advantages and disadvantages of both, but the fact of the matter is, in today's computers, every single computer that comes out today is capable of doing either one, and it depends on which operating system you have installed that determines which one your computer, how your computer is doing. Okay. You guys all have 32-bit operating systems on your computer, which means that you can only use 32-bit drivers. A 64-bit driver will do nothing for you because the data packets are the wrong size. Okay, it's kind of like think of it like this. Okay, uh, Ian drives a a stretch limo, and Nick drives a VW Bug. Okay, if Brandon has a homecoming crew of 12 people to try to get in Nick's Bug, are they going to get there? He can only drive once. Don't say you can make multiple trips. No, they're not, okay? So, uh, again, extreme oversimplification, but the information has to be able to get there correctly. So if you've got 32-bit operating system, you have to get 32-bit drivers. If you've got a 64-bit operating system, you have to get 64-bit drivers. These two things are completely incompatible. You can't use the wrong one. And the only reason I'm bringing this up and talking about chapter four is so you understand the basis of what we're talking about. So when I go to my computer, and this isn't going to work because it never does. I hit Windows pause break. I'm not sure why. You're trying to get away from me. There we go. It used to be so easy for me to get there. Properties. Okay, if you go Windows pause break on your machine, you should bring up the system properties. Okay, this is the most basic information, and it goes, it's actually Windows function F12, brings it up for you guys, okay? If you do Windows function F12, you get the exact same information, but on mine it says, right here, system type, 64-bit operating system, x64 base processor, okay? And on Mr. Wellman's, it says 32-bit operating system, x64 bit processor and the reason it says x64 is because you could put 64 bit on there you have a processor that's capable of doing it we just don't do it and there's reasons for that mine has 64 bit so when i go and install a driver i have to get the 64 bit drivers and when you go install a driver you have to get the 32 bit driver and you need to know that before you go looking not after you try to install okay so if you're ever looking for drivers for your computer that's the first thing you need to know what do I have? And this isn't the important part. This is the important part. What operating system do I have? Because anymore, unless you're on a really old piece of equipment, they're all going to say it's a 64-bit bit processor. It's capable of doing either one. OK, so check hardware compatibility when installing device or OS version. What that's saying is that don't go and buy something that doesn't say it's made for your computer. So when I go out, if I'm looking for a TV card on, uh, we're going to go on Amazon. Amazon. By the way, Amazon is a terrible place, in my opinion, um, to actually look for computer hardware. Not a terrible place to buy it. I don't ever look for it there. I look at Newegg. I look at Tiger Direct. I find what I want, and then I go and look that part, put that part number in to Amazon to see if they have a cheaper. And the reason I do that is because when I go here and look at their TV card here, the amount of information I get on their site is amazingly small compared to what I get on a computer sales site. On a computer sales site, I'm going to see what, what versions of the operating system this is made for. What, where does it say down here? It says stream your Xbox, PlayStation. What? Or we, why does it even say that? This is obviously a PC card. 
Blue, watch YouTube and more instant game view. Add webcam. 1060p recording. Let's see if it says it down here. Perfect streaming, instant game view, stream superior latency. Yeah. Okay, so what what computer and what drivers do I have for this one? Do we know? No. Do you see that anywhere? No, that's why it's terrible, and that's why I, I kind of wanted to show you why I don't look here. Because what what if I went to buy this and this only has Windows XP drivers? Which is usually why they forget to put what drivers are on it, by the way. Forget. Because they if it said only works for Windows Vista, how many people are going to buy it? If they just don't tell you and let you suck it up and try to figure out how to get it to work, it's not their problem. Okay. So when you go and buy stuff, you need to really make sure. So if I, if I went to Tiger Direct, which is now only business, it used to be, I, used to be my uh, favorite place to find uh, stuff and Tiger Direct still exists, but now it's Tiger Direct business, and I'm not sure why they went that way. If I go to Tiger Direct, I usually find out what it's made for. Okay, so right here, it took me no time at all. Can be Windows 95, Windows 98, Windows ME, NT 2000, and XP. Third party Linux drivers are available. For what, how many versions of Linux are there? A lot. A lot. So is it going to work for Linux? Nah, I don't know. Okay. But that's what I'm saying. You need to make sure it works. So if I've got Windows 10 and I go buy this video card, I am saying, eh, good luck for me. Maybe I'll find some. Maybe I'll get it to work. Maybe I won't. But they don't know if it works. Okay. So when you're buying drivers, you really need specifically to make sure you're getting one that's for your version of the operating system. And maybe the next one. If you've got Windows Vista on your computer, okay, Windows 7 on your computer, and you know that you're going to upgrade to Windows 10, then I would make sure it works for both. Because there are things that we have that when we upgraded to Windows 10 didn't work anymore or required a whole lot of work to get them to work. For instance, our TV cards. On every single teacher's, every teacher's computer has a TV card. It only works for 32-bit Windows 10. It kind of looks like it works on 64-bit, but you don't get a picture. So that's not working. Okay. So that's one of the things you have to work, really look for is make sure when you do your drivers that you get one that's compatible for your, for your hardware. Okay, so do you kind of get this? They go around in packet sizes. You're either getting, and the operating system determines the size of the bus, okay? You're either, they, they used to be 16-bit. We don't have those anymore. They're either 32-bit. Back in Windows XP, Days there was it was either 16 and then 32 and then it became 64. Back in Windows 98 days it was 16 and then it became 32, which is that is even a 32. That's a 13. I don't know why I wrote there, but we have teachers with with software. That they really, really, really want me to get to work. Okay? They would love to be able to use this Jumpstart program, okay, that was written back in, let's see, let's see what program, it's version, which, oh, this one doesn't say on the outside, it's good for Windows or Macintosh, uh, by the way, it says it's from C.R. Koblenz Elementary School, that's how long ago it was bought, but there's 16-bit programs, and you just can't put a 16-bit program in and have it work, because it, it's kind of like the drivers. You have to have the right version. I can get a 32-bit program working on a 64-bit on a machine. That's no problem. Get a 16-bit that's so old that it's really, really tough to try to get those programs to work. Not completely impossible, but can take days of work to get to modify those. So anyway, so we have different bit packages. It's either 32 or 64 that we use today. Your operating system determines it, and you need, your drivers need to match. Is that a hand up, Ian, or are you just stretching your fingers out? Do you think um, in the near future they are going to release 128-bit? No, there's, the, right now there's, we're still getting all migrated to 64. Okay. Yeah. So I don't, I, don't, I don't think, as far as I know, there's no plan to go to a larger bus than 64. 64 is already huge. Um, the difference between 32 and 64 made it so that huge addresses can be sent to the point where we don't use all 64-bit. I'm giving you too much detail, but 
Um, one of the downsizes of 64 is because these packets are this big, and obviously overemphasizing for effect, and we only use this much, we waste space as it's going around the motherboard. 64 isn't always faster, but 64 lets us see more memory. Okay, so 32-bit operating system by default can only see 4 gig of RAM. Okay, so if we're going to have more than 4 gig, you have to put a 64-bit operating system on. I've got 24 gig on my machine, I've got a 64-bit processor or 64-bit operating system. You've got 2 gig. So it maximizes the usage of the memory you have by staying 32. If you go 64 and only put 2 gig of RAM in your computer, you're actually not helping anything out. Okay? But if you've got a bunch of memory, you've got to go 64 in order to, in order to see it. Okay, so this, this is to show you how to find drivers. We're going to do an exercise afterwards, after we're done going through the PowerPoint, on how to find drivers themselves. But basically, anymore, yes, they come, CDs come with, with devices. Okay, so I just put in this big, huge ups, and I think I threw it away. And it came, no, it's still my trash, because you never picked up my trash yesterday. Okay, so it came with, brand new, came with this disc, okay? Uh, and this disc was absolutely no use to me, okay? Because they packaged this disc up, I don't know how long ago, this version 2 point something, and when I tried to install it on my computer, it says it's not compatible with this version of the operating system, because this disc is only good for Windows 7. And the program would not install, so I had to go out on the internet and search for it and find the right program, because the program included the drivers. So that when I hooked that up to my computer, now when there's two minutes of power left, my computer will shut down on its own. But I needed the right drivers and I needed the right software to do it. So we're going to go out and look at some different sites today. We're going to go ahead and do it right now, okay? No, no we're not. We're going to, I'm going to do it right now. Um, and find the drivers, okay? So for simple devices, I already said that it can use BIOS for simple devices, but the drivers are always faster if we use the the operating system drivers than if we use the BIOS drivers, okay? So if you see a question on the test and say, which one of these two is faster, BIOS drivers or the operating system drivers? The answer is the operating system drivers, okay? If you have a choice, you should always put in and install the current drivers for your operating system. Uh, this is just a picture of BIOS saying that, by, talking about BIOS finding devices, and we've already talked about that, how it finds those devices, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But when the BIOS goes around and does its thing and it's doing its startup, one of the things we know it does is it does a complete inventory of hardware that it sees and tries to deconflict those, those memory addresses and those DMA channels and stuff that we already talked about. When we're in our GUI, we have some tools to look at our system. And I, we're going to talk about these three tools, okay? So the first one is, is device manager. And you guys will be able to get to the device manager on your computer. I should have got another laptop out for you, Ian, so you'd have something to look at. Uh, I don't know if any of these, if one of these has windows down here. I think. Whether or not it's alive or not, but you will not be able to get to any type of device server. If that one doesn't have Windows, maybe one of the bottom two does. And I will get you a power supply just in case that one is completely dead. Is it completely dead? Yeah, good, it has Windows. Okay, so the first tool that we have to look at our device drivers is uh, the system properties. To get to that, the easiest way anymore is to right click the Windows icon and go to Control Panel which is right here. Uh, I can also go up, I didn't even see it was on here, device manager is right there, so I can go directly to device manager and I'm going to get, it looks different than the one on the screen because that's an uh, older version of the OS, but this is what the device manager looks right, like right now, okay? It's going to give you a pop-up warning that you can't make any changes, okay? So that's not important because you're not going to try to make any changes right now. Okay. Device manager will let us go and see what drivers are installed right now on our system, and it gives us a, a really quick, are there any that aren't installed? If I see any with the yellow asterisk, it means the correct driver's not installed, or it's got a conflict with something else, and I think you guys have that. Don't you guys have one yellow asterisk? No, you don't? I thought you did on, on there. 
thought that was one thing. There we go. See, uh, so he's got a PCI serial port and a PCI communications controller that have yellow asterisks on that says, I don't have the right device driver to make this device work. You need to find it for me and install it for me to get it to work. I don't have any that aren't installed in mine, but we are going to go and install a device driver on mine uh, while we're talking about this today. Okay. So if I go to any one of these, and I'm going to go to display adapter, I see that I've got this NVIDIA GeForce GTX 560 Ti, and if I right click on it, I can go to properties and see stuff about um, this particular device. So I'm looking at this particular thing that's in my computer, this particular piece of hardware. It says it's working properly. If I go to the driver, I can see who made the driver, what the date and version of the driver is, and whether Microsoft knew, knew about that driver. Okay. So on some of yours, you're going to see that they're generic, and you're going to see that they're old, um, because they're whatever Windows had when they installed, and if it worked, we left it the way it was on your system. So go ahead and go to properties, for instance, on your video card, on your systems. Now this is 5-19-2016. That doesn't seem like it's that old. In the case of current video drivers, they get updated all the time, and they get updated all the time to work better with games. That's one of the things that if you're a gamer at home and you have a gaming PC, that's one of the things that you'll want to check frequently and see if there's a new device driver available for your video card, if you have a good gaming video card. Uh, I can see the details on there, and I can click Update Driver. And I'm not going to do it on this one because I'm going to do this one from the site. I'm going to go to the disk drive and go to my Kingston. I'm going to do that one, and I'm going to see if there's updated drivers for that one. You can go at any time to hit update driver and say, I want to look on the internet and see if there's a better driver for mine. So what it's going to do right now is it's going after the internet. Who is it going to talk to right now? Any guesses? Is it, is it, I'm looking for an updated driver for this Kingston hard drive, and it says it's searching online. Where is it searching? It's searching at Kingston? No. Where is it searching at? It's looking at Microsoft, OK? It's looking at the Microsoft database to see if Kingston has turned any new device drivers into them so that they can install it automatically. If a company is not a major company, they may never turn in updated drivers to Microsoft. It's a whole process that they have to get, go through to get the Microsoft certified. So it may work, but it may not be the best one for what you've got. There may be a better driver at Kingston. There may be a better driver at Western Digital. And I think that's a Seagate hard drive right there. The only way to find out is to go to their uh, site. So you can always get updated Windows one, which 90% of the time is OK. OK? 90% of the time, that's fine. If I was to go out here and look for an updated driver for my video card, I'm going to go and see if it, what it says when it says I want to update the driver, whether it finds an updated driver or not. And I will tell you that there is one. Oh, it's going to start downloading. I don't want it to download the Windows one. I really don't want the Windows driver. I want the one from NVIDIA. And I guarantee you this is not the current NVIDIA driver. It's one that they've got certified through Windows. Let's see what version it says it is when it installs. And you see, it, it, this one doesn't take that much time to do. We also have very good internet connection here at Trail. So it found it, it already downloaded it, now it's installed a new driver, and I'm going to write down what version it says it is, and then we're going to look at the NVIDIA site. Because their version is going to be much bigger than whatever I just downloaded from Windows. Installing video card software, obviously. Yeah. 
this way I can't, you know, I, while it's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and go back to the NVIDIA site. So if I want to find it in NVIDIA, I'm just going to go to NVIDIA GTX 550. I'm going to just Google that and see if we get one. Now, some points for you guys, which people don't look at all the time. This title has nothing to do with where I'm going to. This title has nothing to do with where I'm going to. That's just something they put at the top of their site. I'm going to show you what I mean here. Obviously, I'm Googling. I trust Google. I don't trust Yahoo for anything. So we're going to go to Yahoo's site. I'm going to show you something. And I'm going to Yahoo uh, a uh, item. Okay, I had this happen to a, a staff member recently. Okay, and just Yahoo Google Maps. Top thing says Google Maps and Direction. Get Maps and Directions now. Is it going to Google Maps? No. And she had an immediate virus pop up as soon as she went there. Yahoo sucks. Okay, it's not going to Google. It's going to MapsDrivingDirections.org. The second one also is not going there. It's going to FindFastMaps.com, which also says it's Google Maps. This one down here is going to MyMapsDirections.com Earth Maps. Not till the fourth thing down here is it actually going to Google Maps. And so the staff member went and clicked on it and got a big virus pop up and says, you've got this virus, click here, and we'll contact you and, you know, give one of those whole virus things that, that we've talked about before. By going to a bad site, that's because Yahoo stinks, and I'm not saying it can't happen with Google. So don't just read this, read this, okay? Is GeForce.com where I want to go to, or is NVIDIA.com where I want to go to? Now, just so you know, GeForce is an NVIDIA product. But I want to go right here. I'm going to NVIDIA.com. So I'm going to go down here. So don't just read the top. Read the whole thing. So is this the card I have? Yes. Drivers and downloads right down here. And I'm on NVIDIA's website, not some other bogus site. Download the latest drivers here. Oh, I must not have clicked on it. Okay, so I'm looking for a GeForce 500 series because it's a 550. Yep, and my operating system is Windows 10 64 bit. You can see I can drop down and pick a whole bunch of different operating systems for this one. That's great. Language in English. I'm going to hit the search button. There we go. And it is 339 meg. That's a pretty good size set of drivers. Okay, so I'm going to download that. And while that's down, oh, I got to agree. Save that in my downloads. Looks like a good spot right there. And we'll see. Okay, so we got the current drivers here. And now it's saying it's driver version 21.21.13.6909. And it came out 8.1.2016. Okay, so that feature. Pardon? It's from the future. It hasn't been 8. What? Never mind. What were you saying? No, I just... You're making a joke and I'm yeah, not getting made, it? No, I made a joke and it was completely wrong. <laughs> okay, so Digital Signer, Microsoft Windows Hardware Compatibility Publisher. In other words, NVIDIA drew, wrote it, they submitted it to Microsoft to get certified, and then Microsoft then is downloading it for you. When I do that in a minute, it's not going to say that when I do the other version, okay? Do you want to restart? No, I don't want to restart my computer now because I'm going to install the other one anyway. Okay, so that's one of the ways that uh, one of the ways that we can get device drivers. Does that close the whole thing? No. Okay. So and now it's got an asterisk on it because it's not going to work right to our restart my computer. I'm not going to restart my computer right now because we're recording. We're doing this. Hopefully this didn't just mess up my recording in the class for Mr. Driver, Mr. Driver, for Mr. Plankenhorn. Um, and look at all these other unknown devices I've got down here now that are also must be associated with the video card that those will clear up after I do my PC restart. Okay. So that's the basics of going for a driver. You just go out and but you gotta be really careful. If I just Google drivers, believe me. Where did did I leave the Google up? No. Okay. Uh GeForce Video Card. Drivers. If I just am really generic in my search, 
I have G-force up there, but if I just come down just a little bit, uh, let me see if I can, I'm going to go to page two, because even that one was pretty good. Um, there are tons of driver, mm, those are still pretty good. Those are actually company sites. I'm trying to show you one of the, one of the sites that you want to stay away from. Those are actual company sites too. I'm gonna I'm gonna try video card drivers and see if, if I can be unspecific enough to get one of the sites I don't really want to go to. And I will tell you that Google is better at filtering out. Um, no, that's still Intel site. At filtering out the really bad. Um, virus sites that that a lot of drivers are going to be at really really and I, I may not be getting some of them because of our filters here I'm going to jump I'm going to jump down to page five see if I can get one of what I would consider bad driver sites you may not even let me go to that site I guess I should just say so we can move on that you need to be careful when you're looking for device drivers because you can end up at places that have nothing to do with legitimate uh, sites for drivers and I'll just leave it at that okay so some of the other tools we've got um, we've got the system information spot which we already which you already went to but with the the big one now down here is if I go um, if I go down and just start typing system information, this tells me tons of things about my computer that I might not otherwise know. So when I'm working on looking for device drivers and I don't know what I've got in my computer, this gives me a great way to go and say, okay, what kind of CD-ROM do I have in my computer? That's the name that I'm going to search for when I look for drivers, okay? Who's it made by, the manufacturer? I don't even know who the manufacturer is on that one. Let me go to hard drives down here in storage. So my, this one, yeah, does it say the manufacturer on this one? Doesn't. This one's a, a, a Seagate. I know that because it's, the model starts with ST. And if I go and I um, type in this, I will easily be able to find the ST, I have to write it down. If I, if I Google this, I'd be able to easily find who the main manufacturer is because the model numbers are almost always right here in system information. So that's one of the other places you have to look for information. And this one uh, works out really well. So you can see that's one of the disk drives. Down here is another one. This one is a Kingston. Still doesn't say who the manufacturer is, but I can see the size of the thing right here. And then my third drive, I've got three drives in mine, is a Western Digital down here. And I can see that information. So this is one of the great ways that you can look about system information on your computer. The last way that I use is a program called Speccy. And I don't know whether I downloaded Speccy on this one or yet. No, I did not. So to get to Speccy, um, I think I put up the address over there. You can go to... Uh, it, it's piriform.com is the the place that makes Specky. You can also Google Specky. It's S P E C C Y. Um, so I can see it's the right place. So I'm going to go ahead and download uh, Specky, and it, just like anything else, it has a free version. And it has a paid version. The free version works just fine. You can pay uh, 19.95 for it if you wish. Did, oh, I gotta click on this link to go and get it downloaded. Why your program downloads? And this is why it's free, because now we get a nice little advertisement. I like Specky. It does a nice job of giving me a bunch of the information. Who's that? 
make me check for updates. I ain't doing that. What? We're trying to ignore it. Okay. Uh, so once Specky installs, it gives me the same kind of information as the system information one does. Uh, it does a nice job reporting. I can see what kind of CPU I have, how much RAM, and then I can drill down and just say, okay, I just want to know about the video card, maybe. So I got a graphics, and now it's going to tell me even more. Look, here's what my monitor is. Here's what my video card is. And um, I, so I get more information on the stuff inside my computer um, through Specky. It's a nice, it's a nice little program to do that. Okay. The whole point of these is the only way to find drivers is to know what driver we're looking for. And so if you don't have the basic information in your system, you can't do that. This is the last thing on this whole thing before we, uh, I'm going to install the video card and then we're going to look for some drivers too. The difference between a hard boot and a cold boot. If someone tells you to restart your system, it's much better on your system to go to and do a Windows restart than it is to turn it off and turn it back on. Every single time you touch the power button on your computer and start it, that boot up sequence is harder on your computer than just leaving it running. Which is not to say I think you should leave your computer running all the time because then it becomes a power issue and if you're not going to use your computer for three days you should go ahead and shut it down. But if you're walking away and you're going to come back an hour later, it's better to not turn off your computer than to turn it off and turn it on and turn it off and turn it on. Which is one of the re reasons Windows 10 now by default goes into a Windows 10 hibernation mode and it boots faster. Even when you think you're restarting Windows 10, some of the times you're not really even restarting it. So soft boots or warm boots are, are the preferred method of restarting your computer, whereas a hard or cold boot is the is the least preferred method of restarting your computer. We've already talked about this. Uh, this is, I just wanted to show this slide again. Uh, Startup BIOS does the power on self test. It's stored in ROM. It searches for and loads the operating system. The operating system completes its own loading, and that's when we have, and this is obviously very oversimplified. There's a bunch of steps in there that you now know uh, that aren't on this this process, but that's the basic process of starting our computer. And this again is what I was talking about when I talked when I was talking about resources. When it's starting, that's when the BIOS gives out IRQ channels, DMA channels, input output addresses, and memory addresses to every single one of the devices to make sure they don't conflict. And what I I don't although I think you should understand that there are resources that can cause two devices not to work together. It's possible to have two video cards in your computer and they don't work because they're in there together. I had that happen this summer. I was trying to get a third video. I really wanted to have this and that and I wanted to have one mounted on my wall that I could keep system information for the servers up at the same time so I wouldn't have to turn around because I don't really want two PCs. I want just one. I hate spinning around having to work on the other ones behind me but there wasn't a single video card that didn't conflict that allowed me to do that. And it's because of something in here that it that when I put them both in together, they're both using some resource that was the same, and so neither one worked when I put them in together. I got no boot, no nothing. Okay. So this all happens behind the scenes when it's starting up, and you need to do those things happen. Okay? We already know this. When the power's turned on, system clock begins to generate those pulses, the CPU initializes itself. We don't, I didn't talk about this, that it initializes this memory address. I don't think that's important. That's a nitinoid fact that Microsoft puts in the A plus certification exam that I don't believe has anything to do with anything. Do, we, do I need to know that memory address gets initialized? At what point would I ever need to know that? So anyway, so it's on the slide, but you will never be asked that by me, okay? Uh, and then it does the post test, and we already know this, that post checks BIOS program it tests the CMOS RAM, and it tests for battery failure. That's when we get that uh, indication that the date and time may not be set. In the case of these Dells, it stops completely and waits for you to continue on if there's no battery in there. Because if, there, if the battery's out, it's going to make it take forever every single time it boots, because it's not going to remember anything when it does that power on self-test. Uh, this is just to let you know if you're overly pushing a key on the keyboard, it can cause a problem with, with interrupts. 
and then you don't boot at all. So you got to be careful when you're doing that F1, F2 delete key thing to get into BIOS that you could actually make computer not stop, start, okay? It runs tests on the CPU and the CPUs further initialize. If it's a uh, cold boot, it checks a specific section of RAM. Is that important to me? Not really again. What? That's not something we can control, okay? Then it inventories the, those hardware devices and compares it with the configuration information. And some things it's going to tell you. It's going to tell you system memory amount has changed or this boot device is no longer there. And it does that when it checks the information in the configuration in CMOS RAM with what it's just found when it's doing the boot, okay? And initializes all those things, hands out all those assignments, those IRQs, I, I, I am, or DMAs, input out, put addresses, and then it goes ahead and starts handing off control uh, to the OS, okay? And these are some extra things that I, we haven't talked about. Uh, I don't think there's a reason you need to know about the DMA and the IRQs uh, when it goes through the boot process. I just need you to know that they exist and that there can be conflicts, okay? Looks at the CMOS RAM to determine the boot devices and then it goes and looks for that boot device record or the master boot record on those devices. So it looks in the CD-ROM, there could be a CD-ROM but if it doesn't have a master boot record, it means it's not an operating system, so it doesn't try to boot from it, it goes to the next thing until it finds a boot record that it can boot from. And then it boots up the OS through the bootloader. And this is a graphic of what we already know. The BIOS checks the CMOS RAM to ask where to find the OS, and then it loads the OS. And we've talked about that a number of times. And this is just a graphic to show you on the hard drive there is a little record there called the master boot record and it has to find that in order to boot. So just because it has a hard drive doesn't mean it's going to boot from it. If it doesn't find the master boot record it's going to skip on and go to the next device. We're going to spend some time with device drivers. This is our summary slide. We need to know how operating system manages the hardware which hopefully, you know, do you need to know the, the level of detail that, that uh, my friend Doug Moore does because he writes device drivers. No, you just need to understand what a device driver is, how those device drivers interact with BIOS and handoff stuff to the um, operating system. And today was really just an introduction to these system resources. I just need you to know that's part of what it's handing off from BIOS to the operating system. It's saying, hey, it's not, a, not just saying, hey, here's a CD-ROM. Here's a CD-ROM and here's how I've got it set up to use and it tells it what of these are being used. Again, I'm not going to test you on that because we don't need to set IRQs anymore. That, that was something I used to have to do. We, we used to do them with little dip switches when, when, uh, when I would get a hardware, which is why co computer guys exist. Because it used to be really, really hard. But it used to be, if I got a video card, let's see if I can find one with a dip switch on it at all, which I may not be able to do. There used to be little tiny switches that you could flick or, or pins that you could connect together to set the IRQ and the DMA. And you had to physically do those in order to get the next thing working, okay? I don't need to show you one. They don't exist anymore, okay? So we've looked at those three tools we have in the GUI to... Uh, and the, the Speckies one I added, it just talks about the system information and, and the system properties and the device manager, those, those things, but I like using Speccy as well. And then we talked about, and we have in, in uh, Minutia, how the BIOS works and how, how the power on self test works and how we get to the uh, act of, of getting to our GUI. So what we're going to do right now for the rest of the class is you're going to do some, some searching on, for device drivers. I'm going to install this last one that I just downloaded, uh, in which case uh, it's going to cause a reboot. But what I want you guys to do is, did I, did I make it visible? Find my driver right there. Uh, can you guys see that yet? Article 6 drivers are marked complete. Did you read? Did you, if you went through and did Article 6, which is right here, uh, you guys have to just check that you did that, okay? Did everybody do that? You should see Find My Device Driver. I'm not logged in. I gotta log in in order to see that stuff. So, dang, let me get back there. 
So you guys should be able to go do this exercise, and it's a pretty easy exercise, but I want you to go out and try just searching for device drivers. So can you guys see that right now, that find my driver on yours? Um, and if you can't, all you have to do is click the, the checkbox next to Article 6 that you read it, and it should just show up. Uh, and so what this one is, is basically you're going to go out and find a driver. I said I have a Dell E65 on laptop. My sound is not working at all. In fact, I get an error every time I try and change the volume, which is what's been happening to students, okay? Probably missing the sound card driver since that is a program that makes the hardware work. Find the driver I need and supply the link and the driver below. Okay, so I want you to upload the driver. So you've got to download the driver. And I want you to supply the link to where you found the driver. And then we're going to talk about it. So you guys should be able to find that driver easily in the next in the next five to ten minutes. But you need to find the right one. So you need to go and it kind of, this is an exercise of looking through through uh, uh, driver websites. They're all different, but the process is the same. Okay, searching for and finding and downloading a driver. Okay, so that's what I want you to do for the next ten minutes. I'm going to go ahead and install this driver that I downloaded for the video card. And we'll see if this is more updated than the one I got from Microsoft, which it theoretically should be. And see what version we get from that. And I'm going to have to stop this recording because it's going to make me restart the PC here with the video card. And I am curious whether there's going to be any video after the video card little blink that we got when we did the other one because there may be no video there. One of the reasons I do new video card drivers is just to make, to optimize it for new games that have come out, which is why video card drivers change more than uh, almost any other one because there's obviously a competition all the time between video card manufacturers on having the best cards for um, specific games. So that's why when you see, when I'm adding this, it's saying, hey, this works for for Gears of War, and, and some of these are direct um, advertisements because they went together and, and team up with uh, game manufacturers as well. Anybody have the NVIDIA Shield? Anybody seen that before? It basically what that lets you do, you can have a really good gaming computer and you can put the NVIDIA Shield onto your TV and it comes with a game controller and stuff so that you can have a really good gaming computer and then play your game upstairs on your 52 inch flat screen and it's still the same PC game. You're using a, a game controller to basically run it, it streams it through your house video to your, to your big screen TV. It's actually um, pretty cool. You can actually do it from one PC to another. So on my crummy laptop, I can play a really good video game that's actually playing on my PC and I just am seeing it on my, on my laptop that in no way, shape, or form could I install Maybe maybe uh, No Man's Sky or, or or Skyrim or something, but I can play it on that PC just because all it's really doing is bringing the video through my network to it. And you can see it has a bunch of audio drivers that come with it. See it's saying all the drivers that are getting installed at the same time. It's just not one driver. It's changing a bunch of drivers with this download install. So that's why I'm kind of getting, I, that's why I had those other unknown devices 
um, on my PC when that when I did that.